welcome. Uh, my name is Sergi Tourné. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Translation and Interpreting. Um, com sabeu, uh, la nostra universitat és una universitat que pretén treballar i tenir actives tres llengües, l'anglès, el català i el castellà. Per tant, faré servir aquestes tres llengües en, en aquestes breus paraules que us diré al començament. Eh, molts de vosaltres també sabeu que hem posat aquest any en marxa un pla pilot d'acollida lingüística en català pels estudiants que no coneixen català, que es puguin integrar a la societat catalana, tenir un kit de supervivència bàsica. Eh, I per tant, a mi em sembla que en una facultat i un departament que es dediquen a estudiar les llengües, és important fer visibles les llengües. Aquí tenim estudiants de tres màsters, els tres màsters que coordina el departament, el màster en estudis del discurs, el màster en estudis de traducció i el màster en lingüística teòrica aplicada i també els estudiants del programa de doctorat del departament de traducció i ciències del llenguatge. Com veieu, és un públic molt heterogeni i molt divers però reflecteix molt el que són els nostres estudis, que són necessàriament transversals i necessàriament multidisciplinars. Um, he dit que usaré les tres llengües, canvio al castellano. Eh, os deseo a todos un buen curso académico, que sea fructífero y provechoso. A los estudiantes de máster, que este máster que iniciáis sea un máster que satisfa satisfaga vuestras expectativas profesionalizadoras o de formación. También si hay algún estudiante que se entusiasma con el estudio, que se anime a iniciar un doctorado y por lo tanto os emplazo el año que viene a estar aquí en la conferencia inaugural como estudiantes de doctorado. Y a los estudiantes de doctorado que vais a hacer un, un paso un poco más largo por la universidad, os deseo también un buen inicio de vuestros estudios de doctorado que concluya con una tesis dentro de tres o cuatro años que os satisfaga a vosotros y satisfaga la comunidad eh, científica en la que os incorporaréis. Eh, sin más, os deseo un una bienvenido, os doy la bienvenida y os deseo un buen curso. Y os recuerdo, porque esto siempre agrada, que al acabar tendremos un pica-pica ofrecido por, la, por el departamento, por la facultad, eh, y estáis todos invitados. So hello, my name is Carmen Perez Vidal and I'm a teacher on one of the three masters, which is uh, today being inaugurated in this session. Um, and I have the honor and the pleasure of uh, introducing our speaker today, to which in the first place, we want to thank uh, the effort and the time and uh, having accepted the invitation to be here. And I want to do this in the name of the three master's coordinators um, the Master on Translation, which is coordinated by Dr. Patrick Sabalviascoa here present. The Master on Discourse, which is coordinated by Dr. Montserrat Rivas here present. And the Master on Theoretical Linguistics and Applied Linguistics, coordinated by Dr. P Pilar Prieto, also here present. So as I say, um, it is with, um, with great honor that I'm going to introduce our speaker today. We have asked uh, her to uh, prepare a, a talk which would embrace the interests of all of you, so the interests of three masters. And again, this is repeating the words of our dean, we are uh, very cross-sectional and we have a, an array of interest on uh, the masters that we offer in, in the Department of uh, Translation and Linguistics at the Universitat Pompeu Fabra, where we are here today. So her talk is going to be entitled Priorities in Applied Linguistics in Today's Diverse World focus on the communicative needs of bilinguals and bilingual to be preschoolers and those of newly arrived adult immigrants. Now, I'm going to say 10 things about Dr. De Hauer, <laughs> Ten, like a decalogue for, uh, in the way of an introduction. Um, she's currently professor of language acquisition and multilingualism at the University of Erfurt, Germany. And she is the initiator and director of the newly founded Harmonious Bilingualism Network, HabilNet, of which I'm sure she's going to be um, telling us things today. Um, 
uh, in her professional career, Dr. De Hauer has been invited to speak across the globe. Her te textbooks and research papers on early childhood bilingualism are used as teaching materials all over the world. In addition to bilingual acquisition, her numerous publications cover Dutch child language, attitudes towards child language, teen language, and intralingual subtitling. So an array of topics. Very importantly, she has also carried out a micro sociological survey of home language use, so families and how they use languages, by 74,000 individuals. That's it, individuals. Mm -hmm. Her, recent, her more recent research focuses on the role of input in bilingual acquisition and on bilingual families' well-being, the idea of the harmonious, um, behind the harmonious bilingualism network. Now, Dr. Ha De Hauer herself leads a multilingual life, um, something about which I'm sure she's also going to, to, to explain a few more details to us. Three more things. Uh, she has extensive editorial experience. She's currently co-editing the New Cambridge Handbook on Bilingualism, together with Dr. Lourdes Ortega from Georgetown University in the USA, a major publication which will see the light uh, relatively soon. Now, at the university where she is a professor, De Hauer is primarily engaged with teaching in the Master of Applied Linguistics and in the doctoral program on language use and language proficiency. I will end on a personal note. Professor De Hauer has inspired large numbers of researchers interested in bilingualism. In the 90s, that was childhood bilingualism. And I am to be counted amongst them. This is why I have the honor, perhaps, today of introducing her. Her main book at the time, which covered a case study of a child growing up with two languages, Dutch and, uh, and English, inspired many of us taking on also other research studies, case studies, um, very often on child bilingualism or trilingualism by the same matter. The book was a milestone. And many of us have it on our shelf as a, a precious token. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I hope you can hear me. Yeah? The volume turned up? Yes, great. Well, thank you so much, Carmen, for that very nice and personal introduction. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm going to do my best to, um, yeah, to do what I was asked. Let's see whether I, uh, that'll be up to you to evaluate. Okay. So, um, you just have been looking at this map from 1581. It's a very old map, yes, um, for a while now. And um, as a world and as a global community, we've uh, really come a long way. Uh, there's been all these major um, global achievements in many different spheres of life, technology, agricultural, education, medicine, science. And what I consider is also extremely important, there have been also very important ethical achievements. And I don't know if any of you is familiar with the book by Steven Pinker on uh, the better um, angels of our nature, the end of violence, where he gives a whole history of human violence for thousands and thousands of years. And he claims that the last century, well, you know, the second half of the last century was a real breakthrough. And indeed, um, actually since then, pretty much, there's been a wide acceptance of a social justice perspective that fundamentally cares about people's well-being at any stage of life. And I think that the real um, you know, uh, first real milestone there was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in, I think, 1949. And later on, also the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, and also found the Call of Barcelona uh, following the Mayoral Forum on Mobility, Migration and Development here took place in June um, 
2014 in Barcelona. Those are just a few examples. And this presentation is firmly rooted um, in a social justice perspective, and it goes on the assumption uh, that applied linguists ultimately have a goal to serve and a moral, a moral obligation to serve uh, that uh, social ju justice perspective. And I'm going on the assumption that our research should in principle be aimed at possibly helping people in their use and learning of languages. And I want to identify today and explain what I see as some of the most urgent topics for applied linguistics research in today's increasingly linguistically diverse world. And I hope to do that in a way, indeed, as I was asked to do, you know, to kind of um, address m many different perspectives here present. Um, anyway, I, I hope I succeed a little bit. So my axiom is that applied linguistics research should also first and foremost deal with topics of high societal relevance. You can you can select to study anything. You can select, you know, why is the lineup of these red chairs, well, how is it different from that lineup? Is it different? You can choose to study anything, but it's got to have some sense, yeah, because it's your time investment, it's investment of uh, taxpayers who pay you for your work, perhaps, for the university where you're studying. So it's, I think it's good to make, when you make a choice as to what it is you're going to be doing. Well, this is where I would go for the choices. Um, so in today's world, with so many people on the move, multilingualism is really of utmost concern and importance to very many people. And that's uh, why I've chosen, as uh, Carmen was already saying, this um, subtitle for my talk where I'm going to focus on the communicative needs and I've added and the well-being of bilingual and bilingual to be preschoolers and of those of newly arrived adult immigrants. Why? Because in fact these are extremely underrepresented groups in any kind of applied linguistics research. We know comparatively a whole lot more about school-aged children, so primary school-aged children, um, even adolescents maybe, but um, we know very little about these, really the communicative needs of these other populations. So child well-being, that is really of great importance to me, and yes, this uh, harmonious bilingualism network that I'm in the process of setting up, um, it is focused on well-being in relation to bilingualism, and uh, in particular to families with young children, but not necessarily only that. And I hope um, that, well, in my next slides, uh, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll make a few things a little more clear to you. Okay, you all know that by Barcelona is a bilingual city with two official languages. And what does this mean? Uh, there are lots of young children here in Barcelona who do not have an immigrant background, who are born here of people, parents who are born here um, in this area, um, or maybe, okay, a little further afield from other parts of what is still Spain, yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, that might mean for them and I use a lot of color coding in my presentation. Green means it's okay. Red means it's not so good, okay? Um, and anything in between is like, oh well, it's in between. Um, so um, this is green. So that um, there are lots of children who will just hear Catalan at home and in early childhood education, which I will, in the rest of the talk, I will uh, um, make that shorter and say ECE, ECE. Um, so that's the Escoles Bressol and Parvulari um, that perhaps some of you know about. Okay, they can just hear Catalan at home also, but in addition to Catalan, they may also start to hear Spanish in ECE. So they'll go to a bilingual um, center. They might just be hearing Spanish at home though, and will start to hear only Catalan in ECE. 
I'll get back to the color coding in the next slide. Okay, they could also just be hearing Spanish at home. In addition, Spanish to Spanish, they will also hear Catalan in ECE. Then we have fifth possibility of the six logically possible uh, possibilities. They hear Catalan and Spanish at home, but only Catalan in ECE. And in ECE, they hear the same two languages, so Catalan and Spanish, that they also hear at home. So those are six possibilities for children without an immigration background um, who are just um, hearing either Catalan or Spanish or both at home. And so um, I've listed here all those possibilities that were in the next slide, but again, you see there's some color coding going on here. So here, this kid hears just Catalan at home and just uh, Catalan in ECE. So there is a real match, a complete match. This child understands, you know, learn to understand Catalan at home and can understand what's going on in ECE. Green, that's good. Same thing with a bilingual child who has learned to understand Catalan and Spanish from birth at home and is going to a... Um, a bilingual ECE, um, well, school, right? Um, and again, there's a full overlap. And you know, the child is also affirmed in the bilingual identity that's coming from the home because, hey, ECE is also bilingual. Great. Ah, but then we have this red oval where the child is just hearing Spanish at home and is going to a center where they only use Catalan. Will this child understand anything? Yes, they will, because Catalan and Spanish have a lot of overlapping uh, lexis, but it's different. At the same time, it's different. And so the child, if they speak Spanish there, oh, they probably will be understood also, this being Barcelona. But still, um, they're not being confirmed in their speaking Spanish there, yeah? They've got to adjust at age two or even younger. We're talking about teeny tots. So then we've got a child who's hearing Catalan and Spanish um, at, um, at home, and they're going to a monolingual center. So where just one of the languages is being used, well, you know, it's not quite red, it's not quite green, but part of that child's identity, let me put it that way, linguistic identity, is not being confirmed there. And who knows, this might seem strange to the child. Did I forget one? Just Spanish? Yeah, I did. Got, um, what happened to the sound? Is that my problem? Um, I forgot just Catalan at home and having just Spanish. Didn't I? Anyway, doesn't matter. You get the picture. Okay, so just Catalan at home and then having both of these, that's the same. Um, well, that's not, that, that may not be such a problem because there is the Catalan in the school and the Spanish will be on top of that and the child will probably adjust fine. And that's the same with if the child is just hearing Spanish and then be, gets to a bilingual setting, it'll be okay, probably. And there won't be any major feelings of, you know, ooh, there's something else going on that I'm used to that I don't like and that I don't feel good about. It, that, my prediction is that'll be fine. Now, we switch a bit, and I'm coming back to um, ECE in a moment but I want to present to you with some recent data about migration to Barcelona. So I really did a lot of work online and luckily I can, I can read a bit of Spanish and a bit of Catalan. So I think this is okay. I think I did okay with uh, putting these things on there. Uh, so I got it from the statistical department of the Ayuntamiento de Barcelona and some of that information is also in English. So the last data for uh, immigration into Barcelona are available for January 2016. So 
about 270,000 uh, foreigners lived in Barcelona then. Of course, you know, that's only based on nationality, citizenship, in fact. Yeah, so there, that doesn't mean, you know, that doesn't capture necessarily people who have in the meantime been naturalized into being a Spanish uh, citizen who might have a migration background. But these people, and this is the important part, these people come from all over the world. In fact, they represent most of the countries. In fact, when I tallied the countries, um, I got to a number of more, more countries than there are, actually are. So, <laughs> um, excluding the Vatican, yeah, excluding the Vatican, okay. Um, and uh, what's important here for ECE is that at, in 2014-15, 12.2% um, of children in pre-primary education had non-Spanish citizenship. I think that number is probably rising, as it is all over um, the European Union. And these are, and that's really, um, I'm not going to read through all of that immediately, but um, there are huge differences between the numbers of people from a particular country, and here's, I made the top 15, just because, limited by the space I have on a slide, basically, so I just happened to take uh, those where there's more than 5,000 residents, and I indicated here, and that's what I added, um, uh, the, the main languages or official languages of those countries, and I think the one thing that you've got to take away from this is that, um, if people are from one country, that doesn't necessarily mean that you know what language they speak. Yeah, that's very important. And yes, there's a lot of uh, countries where supposedly people speak a lot of Spanish, but like, let's say Peru, well, you know, that person could be a Quechua speaker basically and know some Spanish in addition, or an Aymara speaker and know some Spanish in addition, but you shouldn't make any assumptions about people's first languages. Uh, based on the country they come from. Um, so the expectation for bilingual Barcelona and the larger bilingual region is that there's not only this Catalan Spanish bilingualism, which of course you knew already, but a very, but a very <laughs> diversified multilingualism also for young children. So you could have within one group somewhere um, you could have children basically having 15, 20 different uh, home languages, yeah? Including also, of course, bilingual children have two different home languages than uh, Spanish or Catalan. So, let's have a look at what that means for children from that uh, population who come to ECE. Um, so, you see already on the slide there's no green. There's no green. As far as I know, you know, yes, there are some private schools. There are some private schools which may offer French or English in ECE, which may be uh, some family's home language, some child's home language. Apart from those, um, basically these innumerable X languages, I mean, there could be even 5,000, 6,000 languages actually, we don't know. Um, well, they're not offered, yeah, they're not taught in schools, um, and they can't. I just want to make that quite sure, it's not possible, and it's never going to happen, it's not going to happen, yeah? Um, but, so, a child that has an X language and Spanish, and who's going to ECE in Catalan, ha, ah, well, you know, Maybe it would have been better to take them somewhere where at least one of the languages was present, maybe to an EC school offering, you know, um, operating in mainly in Spanish. But you don't always have a choice, you know. There are several rules, like you can't always go somewhere, plus it costs money. You know, it's not a free choice for parents mostly, yeah. Um, and the same goes for a child who has X and Catalan at home and then ends up in a school that uses just Spanish. So that's like a little bit of double trouble. And then you have these children who just hear the X language at home and then it's regardless of where they are. 
nothing's happening, but it's, it's even worse for them in a way because they won't understand anything in principle, nothing. And if you are like two years old, you have just learned, you know, two. Like this, oh, sorry, sir, like this, they're two, yeah, two. They have just learned to understand language, to start to understand language, maybe even make themselves understood at age two. If they're two and a half, they have usually learned to make themselves understood to people that know them very well. And they've come to expect that they are understood also. And all of a sudden they're in this situation where nobody understands them and they don't understand anything. It's horrible. It's really terrible. It's not good for little kids' well-being. And there are a couple of studies that tell us about that. Um, then we have um, something brownish, so it's not really quite red. So these are children who have had um, Catalan at home as well as the X language. And so if they're going to ECE in Catalan, that's, that's fine, but it's not completely fine. Because again, like in the, with some of the kids who have Spanish and Catalan at home, one of their languages, one of their identities is not confirmed, is not present. It's not the same as at home. Um, and then we have the ones who may hear Spanish as well as the X language, and we have a similar situation there. Well, I often give talks um, in service training for people who work with very young children in ECE, and they want to know from me um, how should we deal with the linguistic diversity that is present in our child care centers and in our preschools? Um, I give them general ideas uh, based on my now very long experience. Common sense, um, ethical considerations, uh, because for instance the United Nations, the Convention for the Child, Child Rights mentions that um, institutes of education should have respect for children's home languages. So if there's one thing I tell them is do not tell people to give up, parents to give up speaking whatever X languages is because, sorry, that's against that convention. That's against human rights, basically, yeah? Then I talk to them about implications, implications from my own and other people's research from talking to people and also a few case-based examples from actual practice, but an actual research basis, well, this little thing here is, is empty. Yeah? There is very, very little uh, actual research basis, which is a pity. Yeah. Now, before I go further about that a little bit more, I want to make very sure that you understand that I fully agree that learning to speak school type Catalan and Spanish is of great importance for all young children in Catalonia. Yeah, I just want to make that very, very clear. It's important for academic achievement, social life, later job prospects. When people come here, they need to deal with the languages that are here. At the same time, there are all these PISA studies, of which you've probably heard through the media over the years, who, that show that adolescents with a language other than the school language at home that they do much less well than adolescents who do have the school language at home. Mind you, a methodological point here that only in the PISA 2012 study were people asked, were the adolescents asked about possibly that they might have two languages at home, namely the school language and another language. But they've given that up since then again, unfortunately, because that was that was really important. You know, all those, those lots and lots of bilingual families, they shouldn't be forgotten. I mean, if you were raised with two languages and you have to indicate your only choice is a dichotomous choice, you know, did you have, uh, like here in Spain, Spanish at home? Um, or did you not have Spanish at home? Well, uh, or did you have another language than Spanish at home? You can only choose either the one or the other. And what do you do if you're bilingual? Which choice do you make? I don't know. 
So the very fact that these adolescents, so they're already in secondary school, that they're really as a group, these um, children with an immigrant um, background basically, uh, are continuously doing badly um, in comparison to non-immigrant populations is of great social, political and also personal consequence for each individual person involved. So there is a huge achievement gap, inequality. And we continue to have that in spite of, and then I'm talking about um, programs all over the European Union, in spite of many educational initiatives to support children's learning of the school language. Yeah. And um, also, at the same time, young migrant background children's increasing participation in early childhood education. I don't know if you know, but in Germany over the last few years, there's really been a push to give a, they don't really have ECE as such. It's not part of the education system, but they have all what they call as kitas, you know, these childcare centers. And they've been really pushing and uh, the government, they've been wanting to precisely capture those immigrant children to get them into a kind of a group situation to give them an early start with German learning. And uh, so there has been a whole lot more of it too, not only in Germany, but uh, in other countries as well. So what is going on? So in spite of all this work, it still remains pretty much the same. Um, well, I'm just going to offer you a few possibly relevant research findings. A quarter, that's one in four, of children who hear a minority language at home, so minority language, I want, you know, that's not the school language, anything that's not the school language, they do not speak it. One in four. So in monolingual child language acquisition, language acquisition is, it's not 100%. It's not 100% because children have language learning uh, problems, as do also bilingual children. It doesn't matter whether you raise monolingually or bilingually, there is a percentage of problems that are going to have a deep effect on you. But it's not that in one, it's not one in four that don't learn their one language. No. Um, yes. It's where actually those data are from um, Belgium and from Australia. And um, yeah, we don't know m much more because those are really the only surveys that can speak to that. Yes. So, and parents feel very bad if their children do not speak their language to them. I made a, um, a literature um, based I wrote a literature-based chapter on that, on, um, if based on uh, research that was done in the European Union. They really do feel bad, you know, and I'm focusing on uh, parents of fairly young children. We know from the United States that Hispanic adolescents, so with a uh, background um, uh, that is not purely Anglo, as they say. I mean, I don't want to hear start a discussion about these categories, although it's very important to have that discussion. Anyway, Hispanic adolescents in the United States feel at a great emotional distance uh, towards their Spanish-speaking parents if they speak English to them. So they will speak English to their parents and their parents will respond in Spanish. <clears throat> and on the other hand, we know from other work from Andrew Foligny's lab that Latin American and Asian background adolescents in the US can cope much better with the stresses of adolescence, which maybe you remember, um, <clears throat> if they speak their, their parents' minority language. Um, just imagine, you know, it, I'm sure many of you have romantic relationships or good friendships and language binds you, you know, using the same language as, as somebody that you feel close to, well, it's kind of normal. It would be really crazy and strange if you had to use another language with them. You would feel an emotional distance. And this is precisely what's going on here. Um, as a huge survey 
of, in fact, children themselves from the uh, Deutsche Jugendinstitut, Deutsches Jugendinstitut. Uh, so they interviewed uh, lots of immigrant background children between the ages of 5 and 13. They interviewed them also about their language experiences. Well, you know, um, many 15-year-olds, well, 13-year-olds, sorry, they would remember how bad they felt when they were very young and very little that they couldn't speak German or that they were ridiculed for their German and um, others had no, well, they spoke very badly of their home language. Um, so that's not good. Um, and at the same time, we know from other research in the United States, um, and that's based on data from Florida, that children who speak their minority home language well at age four, that they make faster progress in their school language, English, a year later. This is the first confirmation of Jim Cummins' um, inter interdependence hypothesis from the late 70s, which he didn't, Cummins himself didn't provide any evidence for that, but this is it. Is you know one language well, you know, comparatively well, well, you're going to do better. It's going to feed into your learning of the next language already at that age. <clears throat> And several U.S. studies show, with regard to somewhat older children, so primary uh, school-aged children, that there is a higher degree of well-being in primary school children who hear a minority language at home and who speak both the minority language and the school language well. So it's got to do with bilingual proficiency, high bilingual proficiency in both languages. And also there is a study out of Switzerland which has really shown that parents feel valued when researchers and preschools pay attention to their first language. This is hardly ever happening. Um, it's like you should, you know, hide that language that you use at home. It's no good. Rather than, ha, huh, here it is. Oh, how interesting. And I don't know it, but you know that language. Wow. So also, and this I think is one, you know, there is this myth, well myth, there is this idea in early second language acquisition that there is always a silent period in which children don't say anything before they start speaking a new language. We don't have huge amounts of data on that, but um, yeah, it, it is true that children who do not yet know the preschool language may spend more than two years in silence. Yes, These kids are just, as you can see there, depressed. They don't know what's going on, they don't understand, and they've kind of, they're, they've kind of been lost in this sea of sounds that they don't understand. So what does that all suggest? That there is something quite fundamentally important going on that has to do with the relation between children's minority language and the school language. And families' well-being is affected by this relation. And if there's anything that children need, it's their families, it's their parents. They're going to be the ones to support them. So we want that, you know, to run smoothly. We don't want parents of four-year-olds feeling alienated from their kids because their kid doesn't speak their language back to them. So perhaps the, the achievement gap is somehow related to all this. It's a big question. I don't know. It's just something I'm you know, thinking of. In any event, disregarding young children's home languages in ECE does not support their well-being. In fact, I think that in ECE, all the children's languages should be recognized and respected. We're not going to have classes in those languages, but they should be recognized, acknowledged, and respected. And I think that it's high time for applied linguists to carry out research and to develop tools that can help support all young children's well-being in ECE, regardless of their back language backgrounds, whilst taking into account their language backgrounds while acknowledging that, yes, they do have a different language background than other children. So these are some relevant questions. 
How can ECE staff show respect for the linguistic diversity in the classroom? And make sure at the same time, these people, by the way, ECE staff, I think they should be paid like at least 10 times more than they are paid. They are doing a fundamental job in all our societies. Um, and they're not, you know, very often in our society, respect is, ex is expressed in money that you get, in salary, yeah? Um, they have an incredible job to do. I couldn't do it, I don't have the patience. Um, it's amazing what they, what they do. Um, and how can they make sure that all children get to learn the school language? Because that's also their task. And make sure that, for instance, here in Barcelona, that the Catalan and or Spanish speaking children, that they also are stimulated in their language development. Because yes, they already have like a, you know, they're further ahead in their language development than, than those that don't know Spanish or Catalan yet. And they should also be um, stimulated. And how can we make sure, can they make sure that all children profit from the linguistic diversity in ECE? And there are many, many more questions. In order to try and tackle this, I think we need to have an ecologically valid approach, which recognizes that language use is really embedded in people's actual lives and deeply affects their socio-psychological functioning. And it also that acknowledges that children's language learning is directly related to the language input and is embedded in interaction. This is not always, I'm, I'm saying this is probably clear to all of you, but there are many people who are working in ECE that I've met that don't realize this as being of super fundamental importance. And also, uh, you can't do this as just one discipline. Um, you've got to have some interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary cooperation amongst ECE specialists, psychologists, sociologists, and linguists. And this is maybe one of the most difficult aspects, which is why it's wonderful that you guys are here all together, even though they're like very, very different masters, because it's just by by pooling resources and knowledge from different strands, different methodologies and different perspectives that we can really tackle uh, these very complex problems. And also um, in working here with people, real people, you've got to recognize the need to include also bottom-up work in cooperation with stakeholders. And for those stakeholders, those are the people who really um, are living in the world that you're trying to um, do research on and with. The parents, the children themselves, ECE staff, teachers, funding bodies, policy makers, all these players uh, play a role. Now, in my talks to ECE staff, I make some simple suggestions for giving a place to all the children's languages in the classroom. But these need more support, so tools from applied linguists. And once in place, these tools need to be assessed for their, and that is then applied linguistic research. I'll just give you a few examples. I've got more, but you know, I got a lot more to say too. If you'll still stick with me. Oh boy, yeah. Um, so here's a suggested action. And then on the other hand, you'll see support tool and research that is needed. One very important thing, try to pronounce each child's name correctly. It seems obvious, but it's incredibly hard to do. Have you heard all these different names from all these different languages? My God, I can't do it. You know, I need help if I want to do that. First of all, you got to realize that it is important because the child's name is the child's identity is very important, you know, for this little kid coming to you and you're the new surrogate mom for a while. Yeah. So what do people need? Uh, they need perceptual help for those of you who are in phonology and phonetics um, and they need production practice. They need to know how particular names are pronounced. They can ask the parents, but you can only ask a person, you know, maybe three times 
to repeat it and then they've had enough of it. No, you need to then, you know, for a new group of children or new children that are coming, you would be helped by this little app which just repeats the name to you a couple of times and then has also a function where you can speak it in and it tells you whether you're right or wrong until you got it right. Then try to find out what languages the children in a group speak. This is not easy. This is not easy and we cannot expect ECE staff to establish that. And many people when they're asked about what language they speak, well they may not want to answer because in their country where they came from, if they said what language they speak, they were shot on sight, right? So we've got to be sensitive to those issues. And plus a lot of people, well, they, um, I once, you know, talked to some guys in, a, in a, a supermarket in Germany. I heard them speak a language that I didn't know what it was, but I thought, oh, that's not Arabic. So on the parking lot, I said, ah, what language uh, do you speak? Oh, dialect. I said, dialect uh where you know we're from uh, from oh uh, yeah well uh we're from morocco so i switched to french with them because of and that already they like that there's a lot of french and i said yeah but a dialect uh maybe it's berber and they were surprised that i even knew the name of that language i also know that there's tons of different kinds of berber um but a lot of people will just say oh dialect meaning it's worth nothing to me. Yeah, Berber is not really a very, it's in Morocco, it's not a language that's given a lot of status at all. Yeah, so people also bring these attitudes from where they come. But if you don't have no clue what, kind, what language it is that these children are speaking, then you're stuck. So what you need is for a particular catchment area, and this is more for the general linguists among you, do some survey work to try and identify the languages that young children there hear. It's not easy. And then, but then it's necessary to find out, you know, for persons in ECE, for the staff, learn to say some basic words and formula in all the children's languages that you happen to have in your group. Expand that to numbers and colors once these basic functions are taken care of. But these people, the staff needs help from people like you who have selected basic um, class or child relevant word forms, maybe in, in cooperation with the ECE staff. Yeah. Um, and you translate them in all the relevant languages and you help staff also to learn to say them. Maybe again, using a little app, you know, like with the names. Okay, I already went through the fields, so we've got general linguistic lexicography, translation, and phonetics covered here. That was from the position of respecting children's home languages and trying to pull them in a little bit by showing, hey, I'm doing my, this, my symbolic best, you know, which already makes kids feel better that you acknowledge. And later on, as an ECE staff member, you can say, I'm sorry, I don't speak your language. You know, I can't help it. And wow, that's great that you can speak. Now, this about um, some examples as regards to societal or school language. So, what does ECE staff have to do? In Germany, they call it sprachliche Bildung. It's basically language input, language teaching, not really, but really language in use, basically. That's what sprachliche Bildung, Bildung is. So use linguistic structures and discourse strategies that support children's comprehension and production of the school language or languages. This is what people have to do. Children do not learn, that we know, by grammar lessons. They learn by example, by using language and by hearing it. And what's the research needed? And here I'm looking at the people who are working in the discourse um, area. Um, well, you've got to identify what are supporting discourse strategies and structures. And we're not, we're not starting here from zero. We know from studies of child-directed speech what kinds of um, uh, discourse strategies might be important. Yeah. Um, but also we have to make decisions like should we tell ECE staff that they first have to just use single words to talk about things to these kids who are no longer that little, you know, who may be three years old. Um, or should we start with simple structures? 
or should we immediately use full and long sentences? How about because that's at the beginning when the kids in fact don't understand anything yet? So how is this going to work? Once they start to say a little bit, should we repeat what they say? Should we give positive corrective feedback, negative feedback? Should we recast just what they say? If they make mistakes, what are mistakes? Etc. And so we need for that to work and to know what we should do and how we should best do it, I think we need observational discourse-based studies. Here are some more specific questions for research, but maybe I will skip those for now because I really do want to get to my um, adult... Um, aha, but this one here, a role for interpreting, because I know there are interpreters here too. You know, in ECE, there um, there will be a lot of... There is need to, to communicate with parents, and you may not have a language, a lingua franca, that you can communicate in. Uh, with. So there is a need for interpreting and how do you <coughs> communicate with a child where you have no common language. Of course, nonverbal speech with little kids, nonverbal speech, well, communication with very little children is of course also important. But what is the role for community interpreting, using um, older children to help out? Those are also I just want to shift now, because uh, time is running away, um, to um, adults. So many adults who live in Spain are recent ar arrivals, their mothers, fathers who emigrated out of economic and or political necessity. And many will have had uh, deeply traumatic experiences before arriving in Spain. Just think of all those people who were actually... Um, yeah, dying to get here, yeah, if just that, the trip. So refugees, asylum seekers, do these people get any specific help or support to help them with the trauma? Now you're thinking, well, now she's going too far. I mean, we're not psychologists, true, but such apparently non-linguistic questions play a role in language learning. People who are depressed are likely to avoid communication and may thus isolate themselves from language learning opportunities. So it does feed into language learning, definitely. And a British report from 2007 reports the need for safe learning spaces for traumatized asylum seekers and refugees. It's something that's often just forgotten about, basically. And um, just very recent research by Zundergaard in uh, Sweden um, shows that traumatized refugees have memory deficits because of their trauma that impact, so that have an effect on the speed of their language uptake. So these are really important things to, to remember. Now, newly arrived refugees, they need to learn the new language fast. And we have just one major study, so there are some of these huge uh, studies. This is a longitudinal one from Canada. Um, there's only one that actually focuses also not just on all kinds of immigrants, but specifically also on refugees. So in this uh, quite unusual study, there are 7% of the 6,090 adults that were studied uh, were refugees, and there was a difference um, in how fast that they picked up either English or French, the societal language, Many had far lower um, new language skills, so I'm ca calling the new language, the language, the destination language, that's also another term that's being used in this literature. Uh, they, many had lower um, new language skills at arrival than other types of immigrants, because you can, yeah, that's understandable, because a lot of these refugees, they're really not there out of choice. Yeah, so they might not, never have chosen to go to a particular country, and often also they don't have a choice in which country they end up in. Um, and also these uh, refugees have less pre-migration language capital, meaning they know fewer languages, they have lower levels of literacy and so forth. And so they need much more support to learn the new language. So beyond psychological help for refugees, what kind of learning support for the new language is best for newly arrived immigrants 
beyond uh, refugees? Well, we really don't know much about this, and there's a whole lot more that we don't know about adult immigrants' new uh, language learning, yet it's important to find out because their new language learning is important for their socio-cultural and civic integration and is also important for the actual, the receiving uh, country. There are differences um, amongst countries in how important they find that, but still it is important. Now, what little research there is has found that, again, this pre-migration social capital, so this language capital is important, and that immigrants make the fastest gain at the beginning. In fact, in the very first months after they arrive, and then also, um, well, up to two years after arrival, and then it kind of plateaus for many of them. Of course, many of them then stop going to classes, uh, whatever, or think, well, they can communicate well enough and so forth. And learning a new language in adulthood can be really quite a challenge for non-refugees, especially in the beginning, as um, uh, research from Australia shows, and the opportunities for real interaction, so outside of language classes, is rare. Well, that's kind of obvious. And what's very important is post-migration exposure to the new language. So we, they need to hear it a lot, and this is where media can play a really important role. For the rest, we really just don't know much, but we do need some answers fast. Newly arriving immigrants are urgently in need of efficient new language support, and we've got some general guidelines from the Council of Europe from a few years back. And the problem is that many of these new, uh, these new language classes seem to be preparations for tests, because very often tests are used to include or exclude people. You know, they have to do well after some time on some particular test, and if they don't, well, they no longer get any housing. In fact, they may no longer have um, the possibility to stay in the country and so forth. So these are really, yeah, this is actually pretty shameful that that exists. Um, so, and, and a lot of these classes, well, they're just like test preparing classes, rather than really looking at what do these people need for their communication, yeah. And also, as um, the person working in Sweden showed, is that these rules and tests place extra stress on this vulnerable population of refugees and asylum seekers. Now, in some other avenues that are likely not a good idea is putting refugees together in classes with economic migrants or other types of new language learners, as often happens. Everybody is just going to a class. Everybody's put together. That really is very hard to work with. You know, you've got in your group, you've got well-educated, literate immigrants who perhaps already know French or English or another uh, language, lingua franca, together with much less well-educated, illiterate immigrants. It's normal that in teaching, you would start to really talk a lot more to those literate, educated people, and you would kind of leave the others and not give them that much, it's, it's a normal effect, a normal human effect. It's not a good idea. Also, a lot of new language learning focuses tremendously on literacy instruction and stays focused on that. Well, people need to talk and be able to communicate, first and foremost. So that goes into, you know, not paying attention to really what kinds of language use immigrants might need in their immediate lives. Focusing mainly on grammar rules. Well, at the very beginning, people need words. So some good practices could be to attempt to build small, homogeneous classes. It's, you know, these are ideals. I realize that there is a lot of work here. I, I realize it's easy for me to say all this, but if we don't say it, then it's definitely never gonna happen. Um, engaging caring interpreters to help with communication in the initial stages. This is happening already in a lot of countries, it is, but more haphazard, haphazardly, not necessarily systematically. Also engaging volunteers as individual mentors and buddies for interaction in the new language outside the classroom. In fact, I have to say I've been really impressed with what's been going on in Germany in that, in that very, for that very point. You know, there's been so many volunteers who, who are really, 
like taking uh, Syrian refugees for shopping, going, etc. Well, all of a sudden, the sound went away. Um, and students' psychological needs, so learners' psychological needs, must gain more of a central place. And teaching methods must also be tailored to this specific population. Think of these trauma-related memory deficits in some people. So building up new language vocabulary rather than first focus on grammar, I think is also important. And then slowly you can introduce some limited amount of targeted reading of things that are really important. Street signs, um, directions and so forth. You've got in real life, you've got to be able to interpret those rather than silly sentences like he walked the dog. Stuff like that. But it all, it's all in those books, in those practice books, unfortunately. Now, there's many things, like for ECE, so I'm getting close to my end here, so bear with me for a little longer. There are many things that you could eventually do, maybe not yet, but maybe later. Maybe assess the most pressing lexical needs. What are the kinds, what's the kind of words, formulas um, that people need when they've newly arrived in a new country? What is it? You know, where are those lists of... You know, I'm not talking here Berlitz lists, those are for tourists, but maybe, you know, something similar to a Berlitz list, yeah? Uh, develop targeted app, because if I've learned anything also, a lot of people these days, including newly arrived immigrants, they have a smartphone, yeah? So uh, develop targeted apps that translate these lexical items from many different languages and into many different languages both in a written and in an oral form, and that people can kind of hear. We know a lot of this already exists, um, but maybe not in a targeted way. Yeah? And for oral language use, uh, and this is where we need the phoneticians, analyze minimal pairs per <coughs> language combination. For instance, Catalan, Russian. Yeah? There are probably specific problems between Catalan and Russian that are not relevant to Catalan and Turkish, for instance. Yes, try to identify what they are and um, incorporate that in some exercises to help people become aware of these differences that are important for communication. Uh, if I misunderstand you um, because you're saying a sound wrong, that's, that's not good. I don't care about accents, I care about true miscommunication, yeah? Um, develop apps that will also help with pronunciation, that gives you some practice, you know, uh, rather than talking to your fridge to practice your pronunciation, as I often uh, advise or used to advise my students to just speak aloud at home. No, you need somebody to give you feedback as to how good you're doing. Uh, develop maybe scripts for teachers to use for effective and respectful teacher discourse sequences in the first um, new language classes and work out ways in which interpreting services could also use, uh, sorry, be used um, uh, in these first stages of new language learning. And in all this, do not forget the potential usefulness of uh, bridge languages like English or French, which are widely known to some extent by many immigrants, not necessarily both of them, but either English or French. Many immigrants these days do know a little bit of them, especially people from Africa will know more French, in, oh, depending on where they come from. And also for TV, and that I think is really a, a, a resource that can be used um, right now, is to have, it's much easier when you hear you know, you hear these uh, programs and you see these programs in Catalan and you are just starting to learn Catalan. It's very difficult then to follow what's going on, but it would be much easier if you had subtitling in your language and then you could follow what's going on and you could learn more Catalan that way because you'd be slowly, you know, by watching more and more TV, you'd be like, Ah, oh, that's what, ah, yeah, well, that's that. And you'd be learning a lot more. So this um, interlingual subtitling, I think there is really huge potential there. And also, of course, you could have the intra 
lingual subtitling, so Catalan subtitled in Catalan, but that's probably not as useful for um, immigrants. And these days, you have all these smart TVs that give all these uh, technical tools to do all this. But of course, it's got to be done in different languages. So we need tools, we need research, we don't have time for big longitudinal studies. We need to find out from learners what they think helped them, didn't help them. We need a bottom-up approach. We need to find out from teachers what they think helped, didn't help. Again, a bottom-up approach. We need to document actual practices. For instance, testing practices should be scrutinized. And we need also a transdisciplinary approach. And there's, um, with regards especially to refugees, there was a, a special issue of the Swiss journal Babylonia just uh, recently come out, which is very relevant um, here. So, to sum up, as applied linguists, we must try to effectively engage with actors and stakeholders. If we don't do it, who will? <coughs> it's hard, so success is not guaranteed. Engagement and respectful dialogue are really key here. Top-down approaches don't help. No ECE, no woman I know in ECE will just accept something just because I'm a professor and she's not. No, you have to engage with people and listen to what they have to say. But by, and indeed, by showing that we don't just operate from our expert ivory tower, but are grounded in the real world and aim for social justice, we can hopefully gain enough respect from non-linguists that they will be willing to engage with us. So let's give it a try, is what I would say. Thank you very much for bearing with me. And here are some of the sources. Thank you. Okay, sorry, I took a little longer. I think you've given us I think a lot uh, longer. many ideas for future studies, maybe for your TSMs. <laughs> you will have to decide on the master's thesis in, in, in only a couple of months. Oh. Very practical ideas and, and, okay. uh, and uh, lines of uh, understanding actually the role of uh, the profession. Many of us yeah. are, are here to be pursuing. So I think this was a okay. extremely, extremely um, eye-opening. Thank you. Do we have some time for questions? A few minutes? Everyone Many people were already and, leaving. And, yeah. uh, but I'd, I'd be happy. Yeah. But, well, I'd, uh, I'd also be happy to, to field to questions over uh, wine. And over the food. reception? <laughs> I don't know. Is there any pressing questions? Oh yeah. Did I make a mistake? Oh, no, but uh, it's just, uh, yeah. yeah, on the Spanish Catalan, uh, you know, uh, predictions that you, you were making, right? I mean, the, we have a highly bilingual society, so yes. if uh, a person, yeah. uh, a kid enters, uh, you know, uh, elementary school, yeah. you know, normally they, they have had a lot of contact with the other language, if not at least 20% of the time, if 10, I mean, there is, TV programs, you go right. shopping. I mean, you have a lot of, so presumably I see like a very, I, 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 I felt like it cannot really be compared like the Catalan Spanish situation with, you know, some uh, immigrant that comes in. Right. It's like, a, you know, like a, a 10, 15 families uh, talking only in this language and have a uh, mm -hmm. few contact with so, uh, yeah, True. I mean, I just wanted to hear uh, yeah. you, but well, of I mean, we are very proud of our system and we think it works. It has been, uh, you know, also assessed. Oh, yeah. So, oh, no. I, mean, I, I, I was feeling a little that. bit like... Oh, oh I yeah, see. Oh, no, no, no. This is not <laughs> meant as a, this is not meant as a criticism. Mm -hmm. At the same time, though, for just these, um, if, like, for these kids, here we are. Right. So if a child just has Spanish at home and just goes to a Catalan um, preschool. Well, the thing is that it, it, 
It doesn't. It doesn't well, according to the information you, that I have, because hmm. I looked at a whole, I found a whole overview of language use in ECE in Barcelona. And it was all listed by, in particular areas of the city, you tend to have more bilingual preschools. In other areas, it was tend to be more Spanish only. In others, it was more Catalan only. Mm -hmm. So there is that difference. So that's yeah. so it is possible that children yeah. go to a non-bilingual preschool. Yeah, that that yeah. the case that you have depending on the the area you exactly have more depending on the language. area. But also, you know, yeah. when you go to school, there is a variety of languages being yes. spoken by the children and also by the teachers. Even though there is an immersion program, you, there is all these, you know, well, complex wonderful. things happening. So it's, uh, yeah, a bit, uh, you know, too mm -hmm. much saying just the Spanish since it's right. Well, I think that situation. definitely the being the bilinguality of Barcelona, not of any bilingual city, because I'm well aware of Brussels, and it's completely different from Barcelona. But the openness that exists in Barcelona towards bilingualism mm -hmm. is, of course, of great help mm -hmm. to also pe children who don't know uh, Catalan or Spanish. There will, I think, generally, but this is for you guys to do studies on about the attitudes of people in early childhood education towards other languages than Catalan and Spanish. Maybe I'm hoping that yes, this being used to having a, you know, living in a bilingual city, that it gives people a more general openness. In fact, there are some studies uh, suggesting that bilinguals in general are much more culturally open. I hope for this to be true. Yes, but we need some of the evidence. Yeah, we need some, some evidence. So, um, and I do believe though, and this I think is important for little children because you just mentioned like shopping. In shopping, yeah, kids might hear something, but if they're like two, two and a half, they're not necessarily paying any attention to what somebody is saying, some adult is saying to some other adult about something they're not engaged with. So I think we, we have to make a, diff a difference between these very young children and older children. Um, very young children, they have very small lives. And it's what happens in their immediate vicinity that really matters for their language acquisition, rather than what is present in the community as a whole. Um, a child can be leading a totally Turkish-only life in bilingual Barcelona. It's completely possible, for instance. Yeah, so we've got to realize that. Um, and of course, we want to change that. We want to open up that child to other languages, obviously, yes. But thank you very much, and I'm sorry if I gave that uh, impression. I didn't mean to do that. Yeah, no. Thank you. Yeah, yep. Um, hi. So I'm really interested in subtitles and uh, oh, yeah. its potential, well, in general, potential of you know, multimodality for yes. language learning. Yep. Has there already been some research? In Not in with immigrants, but uh, I've done uh, research on this myself uh, with 12-year-old uh, 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 children in, uh, in, the Net in Belgium, in the Dutch-speaking area of Belgium, who we... Um, it's research under my direction that was done um, where we gave them language tests. They had never, in English, they had never had any English classes. They had nobody in their personal lives that they used English with. They had never been to an English speaking country. But we also asked them about their media use and about their media habits. Mm -hmm. And we actually tested these children on their knowledge of English in the beginning of secondary school, which is when in Belgium, in Flanders, that's only when they start to learn English. And a lot of teachers had already told us, well, you know, I got these kids, you know, in my classroom, I'm starting at the beginning level of English, but there's already some that know so much English and others that know very little. So we knew there was something going on, This, which is why we did this study. And we worked, I think it was like 380 children that we had, so it was a pretty large sample. And it was very clear, those kids who watched mainly English language TV, which in Flanders, 
in Belgium is subtitled in Dutch. Yeah. So they'd been watching this like for three years, you know, every day they watch these English language um, TV programs. That was the one factor compared to kids who didn't watch that much or who tended to watch other kind of programming which wasn't English language. Well, those kids who uh, watched all that, they did much better on the four. We had four little tests, some of which we just developed ourselves because what are you going to do? You're going to test kids who haven't had any English. You're going to test them on their English. So we tried, what can we do? So we had a few translation tests. We had a few imitation. We had an imitation task. And, you know, some kids scored like top on everything. So there was a lot of variation between children and it was correlated completely with their um, TV watching habits. So. Thank you. It's worth pursuing. Yeah. Uh, hello, just to compliment your answer to the question, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and some of the research has been carried out here uh, oh. as part of a European uh, research project, oh, okay. uh, subtitled and language learning. Oh, think. great. Mm. Thanks very much. Didn't know about that. Not, not, not addressed specifically to very no. young immigrants no, but across the board. Right, right. Uh, as a general question. Well, yeah, yes. If subtitles can help people learn language. Yes. Oh, great. I'm so happy to hear that. Yeah. Sorry? Uh, SLO, Subtitles for Language Learning, uh, funded by the European Commission. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Yes. We also had another project which was uh, not watching, but actively doing. So in schools and uh, in, in uh, distance learning, where one can actually do the subtitles or, oh. or dub. Okay. And that project's called Glipflare. So Great. Uh, even here. <laughs> Great, wonderful, yeah, yeah. Because I think that there, there are, you know, all TV in Germany. You know, it's just German that you hear on TV, and it, everything is dubbed. And it's such a, such a wasted opportunity for foreign language learning, um, not just of English, but of any other language. You, and you don't hear all these different sounds. And that I think is so important. Also in ECE. Uh, just the very fact that um, ECE staff would use, would be able to say different um, forms or words in different languages and also would then help all the other kids in the classroom to say those. You know, it just can maybe keep the ears open because this is really important for learning another language is to have open ears that you're willing to listen that you're willing to pay attention that you've learned from early on not just you know beyond the first year of life that keeping your ears open um, that uh, sounds can be different and that is so important for learning for just having an entrance into a new language Once again, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.